Hi, you are in the ladies' room with Dr. Donica, the only public ladies' room you can enter any time without ever waiting online. I'm your host, Dr. Donica Moore. We'll be having real conversations with real women about really intimate issues. They may be embarrassing, sad, or funny, but they will always be interesting and informative. You know, like the best conversations you've had in ladies' rooms with your best friends or total strangers and a physician. Please join us. Hello and welcome to season three of In the Ladies Room with Dr. Danica. Today, we're gonna talk about vaccine preventable illnesses. And we've heard a lot in the news lately about the measles outbreak. And this is a travesty on so many levels because measles is a highly contagious, but almost completely preventable that was declared eliminated in the United States in 2000. But today we're gonna switch gears and in support of World Meningitis Day, we're gonna talk about another vaccine preventable virus starting with M, meningitis. And meningitis can actually be caused by viruses or bacteria. So the bacterial forms are the kinds that are prevented. Now today we have two wonderful guests. We have uh, Patty Wukovitz, who's a registered nurse and meningitis advocate because of the worst possible circumstances. She lost her 17-year-old daughter, Kimberly, to meningitis B in 2012. And she has since then mustered all of her resources and started the Kimberly Coffee Foundation to improve, improve awareness of meningococcal disease and the vaccines now available to help prevent it. Patty lives in Massapequa Park, New York with her husband, John. And in addition to Kimberly, who will be forever 17, she has three other adult children. With us also is Alicia Stillman, who is also a meningitis advocate because of the worst possible circumstances. She lost her 19-year-old daughter, Emily, to meningitis B in 2013. And she has since mustered all of her resources to start the Emily Stillman Foundation to improve awareness of meningococcal disease, the vaccines available to help prevent it, and to encourage organ and tissue donation. Alicia lives with her husband in West Bloomfield, Michigan, where she's the CFO of a multi-state law firm. And in addition to Emily, who will be forever 19, she has two other adult children. Now, Patty and Alicia and their foundations, the Kimberly Coffee Foundation and the Emily Stillman Foundation, have partnered together to launch the Meningitis B Action Project. And that's what we are going to talk about. And of course, we are dedicating this episode of In the Ladies' Room uh, to both of uh, these young women who we lost way too early and uh, we want to always remember. And hopefully it will be because their memory has served to do good for other people and prevent this in the future. Welcome to the ladies room. Thank you. So I think the first question on everybody's mind, because we live in a very judgmental, divided society, is why didn't you vaccine, vaccinate your children against meningitis B? I'll answer I'll that one. Um, <laughs> yeah, so my, my daughter, Kim, uh, I couldn't vaccinate my daughter, Kim. We didn't have a meningitis B vaccine available in 2012 when she contracted meningitis B. And right. I thought my daughter was fully protected because I had given her the meningitis shot. And in fact, she wasn't fully protected. Because so this is a really important point. The meningitis yeah. B vaccine was not available until no. late 2014. And that's why I emphasized uh, when your girls contracted meningitis B. My son was actually in college at the time. And of course, college students or anybody who lives in proximity with lots of other people, like people in the military who are in barracks, for example, prisoners, are at much higher risk for meningitis. And I sent my son to college in 2013 thinking he was fully vaccinated right. for everything, yes. including too. meningitis. Yeah. But that was the other meningitis. And that vaccine is called the conjugated meningitis vaccine, or what we sometimes refer to in shorthand as meningitis A. So everybody needs to know, if you know nothing else from this episode, that there are two meningitis vaccines your children now need. So Patty, tell us uh, about what happened uh, with Kim. So Kim was um, a 17 year old, uh, just living her life and going on, you know, just skipping along. And uh, she was a very vibrant girl. She had a, uh, a beautiful smile. She was very caring. She was my only daughter. And um, her dream was to be a pediatric nurse. And she was getting ready to go to college to be a pediatric nurse. 
and um, her favorite thing was to be at the beach, have her toes in the sand, you know, to go take the ferry over to Fire Island with her friends. That was her ultimate day. Um, however, in 2012, when Kimberly was a high school senior on Long Island, she was in her last two weeks of school and she came home and complained of body aches and she had a fever of 101. So I told her to take Motrin. Uh, she was fine after that. For the rest of the day, she was fine. I slept in her bed with her that night, um, just rubbing her back, just wanted to be with her. Next morning we woke up and she said, mommy, everything hurts me so badly from my, from my eyes down to my toes, everything hurts me. And she said, and I feel like my ankles are bleeding. Mm. So I looked at her ankle and I saw three tiny purple dots. I saw the petechiae starting and being a nurse, I knew it was serious and I, uh, you know, panicked a bit. <laughs> And shortly after that, she complained that she had intense back pain and I saw this reddish purplish rash go right up her back, right in front of my eyes. So I rushed her to the emergency room. And the doctor in the emergency room told me that she believed that Kim had bacterial meningitis. And I told the doctor, no, no, my daughter's been vaccinated for the men with the meningitis vaccine. She can't have meningitis. And uh, you know what I later learned was that there was no meningitis B vaccine available at the time, and she did have meningitis B. I had never heard of meningitis B. Um, it, it, was, it just blew me away. I just, I just had no idea, and I thought she was fully protected. I made sure my kids are full, you know, up to date on all the vaccines, so there was nothing more I could do for her at that point. I couldn't have prevented it. Um, within hours of her being in the ICU, her heart and her kidneys were failing. Um, she went to cardiac arrest. She uh, was resuscitated. She was put on um, a ventilator and um, she had a purplish rash spreading, spreading over her entire body. And she was losing blood flow to her extremities. Her arms and legs were pur bright purple and then they were black. Um, so a few days later, it was confirmed that Kim, Kim did have meningococcal disease. Um, she had meningococcemia, meaning that the bacteria had infected her blood. And she was fighting for her life. And, you know, this is a kid that was just sitting in a classroom with her friends, that, you know, just a few days before planning prom and who's wearing what color and what shoes and, you know, who are you going with and getting ready for graduation and college. And it just, it's mind boggling how quickly this disease can take somebody down. And it's just so aggressive. Um, after a few days, it was determined that she was brain dead and I had to remove my otherwise healthy 17 year old from life support. It's, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. And the work that I'm doing with the Kimberly Coffee Foundation and with the uh, Meningitis B Action Project is to help prevent another parent from having to live this un, unthinkable and unbearable pain because they are now in the power. They have the power now to protect their kids against meningitis B, but I did not have. And I just don't want anyone to ever have to go through this again. Well, I give you now. Incredible, incredible credit for, for doing that and for stepping up. I have to say, as a physician, I did not know about meningitis B until the outbreak at Princeton University, which was in February, March of 2014. And that did get national coverage. It was the biggest yes. outbreak because there were eight students. But Alicia, tell us about your daughter and tell, her, tell us your story. So Emily was 19 and she was a college sophomore. She went to Kalamazoo College, which is a small liberal arts college here in Michigan. And Emily's dream was to be on Saturday Night Live. Oh, that's husband, my daughter's dream. <laughs> so my husband and I um, told her she had to have a plan B. So her plan B was psychology. So she was a double major. But she was very funny. And most likely she may have ended up on, on Saturday Night Live. Um, she called me one night and she had a headache. And I said, oh, you're probably getting the flu. And she said, no, I don't think so. I, I was up all night studying last night. I had two very large tests. So you know how I get when I don't feel good? She said, I get that achy feeling and, and a headache. That's how I feel. I said, all right, so go to sleep. 
why don't you take some Motrin and go to sleep and we'll see how you feel in the morning. That's like the typical mommy answer. We right. think the treatment for everything is Motrin and sleep. Take and Motrin mother, and sleep. <laughs> you could tell me just sleep because that was before Motrin was invented. But, yeah. um, but that conversation. Of this is it begins like it seems like a cold or the flu. Just a headache. Like it, it could start. And for my daughter, it was always just a headache. She woke up a few hours later and she said to her roommates, my head still hurts and it hurts really bad. Maybe I should go to the hospital. And they took her to the hospital, but she walked into the hospital. She wasn't going planning to die. She walked in. She had her backpack that was filled with her, her phone, her iPad, her computer, her, a textbook. I mean, she was going for them to fix her headache. And because she simply um, presented with a headache, they treated her for a migraine. As the evening, as the early morning hours, you know, progressed, she, her mood started to change and she got what, how they described it as a little combative. And um, that is symptomatic uh, of a meningitis or a meningococcal disease. And so that is when they began to suspect there could be something else going on. I was not called until the next morning. Emily was 19. Uh, by the time I was called, she was already in a coma. She had been intubated. Um, and they told me that I should get to the hospital right away because my daughter had been admitted to the hospital during the night with bacterial meningitis. I said, it's not possible. My daughter can't have meningitis. I remember that she had the meningitis shot. When I sent my daughter and all my children off to college, I made sure that they were fully protected with all vaccinations. I had the talk about safe sex and covering your drink in a bar and, and not walking alone. I mean, all the things you do as a mother. And vaccinating was one of those things. Mm -hmm. They said, well, we'll talk about it when you get here, but for right now, just come. Mm -hmm. I was two and a half hours away in the car along the way. Um, I, I kept calling and kept calling and saying, double check the results. I don't want something else to go untreated. I also called her pediatrician mm -hmm. and I said, just remind me, I, I know I remember her getting the meningitis shot. Tell me the date. And they said, in fact, Emily had had two meningitis shots because it was her year that, that it had changed to needing a booster. So she had received it at 11 and again at 16 um, before she left for college. So she was what I considered to be fully protected. I had no idea that there was anything called men B. I had no idea that it was only going to protect her against four zero groups, not the fifth. I had no idea. My daughter had, um, at that point, they gave, they wanted to perform a craniotomy. They said if she was going to survive to lessen the degree of brain damage, we needed to give her brain room to expand. Right, because of the pressure. You know, what we should probably explain to everybody is what meningitis is, is mm -hmm. an infection of the lining around the brain and the spinal cord. And that's why it causes all of these symptoms. What we should also explain is even though we're talking about two meningitis vaccines for bacterial meningitis, there are also other things like viruses that can cause meningitis for which we don't have vaccines yet. Um, and other causes. There are also other bacterial infections besides meningococcal disease that are vaccine preventable too. But both Patty's daughter and my daughter had meningococcal disease, um, which is really caused by five um, different serogroups of a bacteria called Neisseria meningitis. Mm -hmm. And so when, after she passed, uh, at some point, how did the two of you meet? Alicia. Oh, I found Patty on Facebook. <laughs> Thank God for Facebook. <laughs> you know, we're always busting on Facebook oh. for the bad things, and it deserves it. Well, but I'll never forget when I went to meet her for the first time, and I had to tell my other kids I was going to meet my new friend that I met online. <laughs> They must have been so suspicious. But and, Mom, you and told us not to do that. Social media brought us together because I was reading about the activities of your group 
on Twitter. And I said, we have to talk about this. Parents have to know about this. And of course it resonated with me, you know, because I was in that situation. Uh, I had both of my children in college at that time. And Princeton did an amazing job getting the vaccine for the Princeton students, even though it was not yet FDA approved. They went, they moved heaven and earth to get it from Europe. And uh, I remember when they had a vaccine day, I texted my son the night before, and I, in all caps, which I know is a really bad thing to do, but I texted him in all caps saying, if you're not first online to get that vaccine, you're going to have to worry about mommy gitis more than meningitis. Um, but 92% of the Princeton students were able to get the vaccine. But there I was with a daughter in another college who was not able to get the vaccine. And one of my physician friends actually took her children to Switzerland for spring break, mm -hmm. specifically to get the vaccine. I know. In 2014, um, I live in Michigan, which is right on the Canadian border, mm -hmm. and Canada had the vaccine. Mm -hmm. So I was chartering buses mm -hmm. and whole families were coming into Michigan from all over the country and riding on the buses. That's where Patty and I both were vaccinated the summer of 14, um, holding big pictures of our daughter um, and, and a bo box that housed that vaccine that to us was like gold. It was like a winning lottery ticket. It would have saved their lives if we had had it, yeah. you know, like that's. That's, that's the shame in all of this. And, and now it's just so important that parents know. We, we didn't know, we couldn't know, the vaccine wasn't here, but it's here now and we need to use it. Right. Now, um, did, um, Alicia, did your daughter have the rash or she just no. had the headache? My daughter, um, it, my daughter did not have meningococcemia. My daughter, only had meningococcal. It stayed in her in brain her. and the spinal column that, that went up to her brain. Most likely from the time she lost consciousness, she was already brain dead at that point. So all her organs, my daughter, I was able to donate all her organs because for her, it never went into her brain, into her, excuse bloodstream. me, her bloodstream and transferred anywhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, with, with Kimberly, it as Patty explained, it had gone already into all her extremities and her organs. Right. So her and organs Kimberly, couldn't be donated because they were no. infected. Right. And she went into multi-organ failure. So Alicia, that's another, you know, blessing in this horrible story. It is a blessing. Um, how many people benefited from your daughter's organs? So Emily was able to to um, be a hero, she was able to save five people with six of her organs, but mm -hmm. countless others with tissue and, and bone and, and, and other parts of her body, but five people with six organs. That's incredible. And you were the hero because, of course, in that situation, you're faced with the worst possible nightmare and thinking of other people's children. And that's what you're both doing right now is saying, okay, I'm willing to tell this gut-wrenching story again and again to benefit other people's children. So first of all, who needs to be vaccinated for meningitis B? Okay. So 16 to 23 year olds are at highest risk. Mm -hmm. So the CDC recommends that um, meningitis B vaccination is given between the ages of 16 to 23, preferable age of 16 to 18. Right, and of and course, it is, and it is a uh, not a one dose series. It's a multi, you know multiple dose series. So when you just get one uh, dose of meningitis B, you're not done. Right, and this is in addition to and the conjugate to the, meningitis. Exactly to what I refer to, and you refer to as the men A vaccine. The men ACWI is what we call it because those are the the four sero groups that it protects against. And that's the proper so, name for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the men ACWY protects against zero groups A, C, W, and Y. And the meningitis B vaccine protects against zero group B. Yeah. The, uh, the Princeton kids actually had a sense of humor about it. And you know, the good news at the Princeton situation was there were eight children who were infected or students who were infect infected, but none of them died. Right. So that was a miracle. And in, in large part, because one of the things that's different about Princeton 
is it is a very small university and almost everybody lives on campus, but there's also an on-campus hospital, um, which that was another thing that I stressed about with my daughter was not in a school that had an on, they had an infirmary that was open from like 10 to four. And what college students are even awake from 10 to four, <laughs> let alone going into the student health, which just, they would just either give you Tylenol or they would refer you to a hospital that was a 22 minute cab ride away, right. which was kind of unacceptable. Um, and I wish I had known that before my kids went to college. I just got lucky with my son, but I didn't think about that. That's something, right. But, that's something that parents should look into. Yeah, that's that definitely something to look into. And tell us about what are the requirements for colleges? I, know, I thought that was very interesting too with my two children. They went to colleges in different states and the different colleges had different requirements for vaccines. They do, they do. There's currently only 14, I believe, Alicia, right? Mm -hmm. 14 colleges that are requiring meningitis B vaccination. Yeah. Out of was... thousands of colleges that we have. Um, many parents are under the impression that their child is required to be vaccinated against meningococcal disease. Um, for example, in New York State, we have, in New York State, we have a waiver. So the parents have to have the education, they get the educational piece, they learn about it through a form that is given to them, and they can, they have the option of checking off, I, do, I decline this vaccine, or my child has had it and provide the, you know, the backup of that. But no, there are not, not every college requires it. So it is, it's state, it's not even just state specific, it's school specific. Well, I think schools have to follow state guidelines or state mandates, but then they have some, they can do additional they things. Have leeway, right. I find it very interesting that some of the schools are um, requiring and strongly recommending um, the, the meningitis ACWY vaccine, um, and, and then they don't mention men B. Mm -hmm. You know, when in fact, all college outbreaks since 2011 are men B. 100%. And 100%. And over 50% of the total cases in the United States are men B. So why are we, you know, calling out the men ACWY? Why are we bothering, so to speak? And I put that in quotes because I strongly believe we should be bothering. <laughs> um, but why are we giving the men ACWY and not the men B? Well, I think one of the reasons we don't have as many outbreaks with ACWY is because more people are vaccinated. Right. Correct. Correct. Right. So why would we choose to only 80%, four out of five, protect these kids that are so at risk? I mean, as medical professionals, professionals as vaccine advocates, as healthcare professionals, um, we are dropping the ball. The colleges are dropping the ball. The medical community is dropping the ball. The advocates, we are dropping the ball someplace because the physicians are still not talking about it enough. Well, we are today. Yes, yes we are. We have yes. World Awareness, Meningitis B Awareness Day, uh, which is this week. So we want to talk about it. And for everybody who's listening, I think the number one thing we want people to do and to know is that if you have a child who's over 10 years old, because they can get the vaccine as young as 10, you need to ask your doctor and be very specific and say, has my child had the meningitis vaccine A or ACWY, the conjugated vaccine for the four strains and B? And if not, when do they get it? And this is for everybody who has anyone in their, you know, any of their children or anyone in their family over 10 up to 23, or who is also living in a college dorm-like environment, in prisons, in the military. Uh, it would be interesting, do either of you know, does the military require meningitis B? No. Um at the time when Kim was sick, my son was actually in um, army boot camp, mm -hmm. and he did not have meningitis. Well, we didn't have. Well, it at, at that time, time it uh, wasn't available to anybody. Right, in right. States. But when it did become available, and he still was in the service, they did not offer it to him. It wasn't even covered by the insurance that the um, army gave to them. Wow. So of course, I had to send my son outside and send him to um, a travel clinic in Georgia at the time, mm -hmm. and he got it. So, you know, we do what we have to do, but who else is going to do that? No one's really going to go and take that extra step and 
you know, take their kid to an outside clinic. It's just too difficult. Well, they are when they know the consequences. Well, and this, and that's another really important point, um, Dr. Donica, that, you know, there's a difference between public health and, and private health. Mm -hmm. And by that, I, I mean, um, you know, yes, this is not real common. So the doctor may say to you, oh, they don't need that. It's rare because some of the doctors are saying that. But you have to know, I want my child to be protected, as protected as they can be. It's rare, but what I always say about rare disease or rare diseases is that the incidence is 100% when it affects you or somebody you love. Touche. My, my daughter is 100% gone. Yes. And, and nothing can, nothing can change that no. ever. No. Um, in your case, there was nothing you could have done differently or better. And I hope that brings you some very, very small degree of comfort for all the parents who are listening. There is something that we can do differently or better. And for everybody who's involved with college health or a community health program. So I did look up at Princeton University, what they are doing. They still don't require it, but they do have a free clinic four times a year. And even that first year, I spoke to the medical director um, at Princeton, and he said that the very first clinic they had for vaccines, they had 92% of students got vaccinated in one day. And the reason is because they were terrified. So they all knew about this. Obviously, they're also highly educated. And you know, the university made sure that they were all highly educated. But then you have to ask yourself, well, who were the 8% of the students who did not get vaccinated, which I did ask the medical director. So number one, the kids who already had meningitis B did not get vaccinated. Um, number two, all the students who were traveling abroad on you know, junior year abroad and, and student programs. And a third group was very interesting. Um, and the third group they did have a separate clinic for a couple of months later. This was um, the end of the athletic season for many sports. And so one of the side effects of the vaccine is what they called menge arm. It yeah. gives you a sore arm Very sore. for, for exactly. several days. Uh, and the kids all joked about it. And, and my son said he really couldn't move his arm for like yeah. three days. So all of the elite athletes who were in sports where they couldn't miss three days of practice waited till after their season. I would have put my child in big trouble if he had done that. Right. Uh, and then the fourth group, who I also had a friend whose son was in, uh, was in this group, was um, the students who are severely immunocompromised because of other diseases. Mm -hmm. So one of my friend's sons was a student there at the time, and he was battling a horrible cancer. And his dream was just to graduate from college. And she actually pulled him out of school because she was so terrified of the meningitis, which he, of course, would be even more susceptible to. Um, the good news is he did ultimately graduate. The bad news is he died three days later of this horrible cancer. So the point being, whenever we're talking about vaccines, we also do have to talk about the people who can't get the vaccines uh, because they have some other disease um, and we need this protection of herd immunity or other people being immunized. So we just have a couple more minutes. Tell us about World Meningitis B Awareness Day and what kind of projects you're involved with that you want people to know about. Okay. Can I make one more point just about the, Absolutely. Okay. the situation at Princeton where there was an, an outbreak, there was eight people who came down. Um, as scary as outbreaks are, and I, I can imagine that that was very scary to be a part of, I just want to make sure that anyone listening realizes that the majority of cases are actually one isolated case or two yeah. um, ones and twos all over the country for any age group. So well, when and this condition is so rare that a quote unquote outbreak is defined as four or more cases. Mm -hmm. And and the public though never hears about it. Like, right. you know, it might have made local news when you know when Emily was sick and, or Kimberly was sick, but not the national news like the Princeton outbreak did. So yeah, people kind of think point. it's more rare because they don't hear about it as much or they only hear about a few outbreaks a year. So. And that's a very good point. And the other thing yeah. people need to understand is that even though it's rare, one in ten people who contract meningitis B 
do die within 24 hours. The other thing that's important is that the bacteria is a very, very common bacteria. It's actually a bacteria that is a harmless bacteria that lives in the back of, um, of our throats of, of many, many people. And they are asymptomatic and they will never get sick. They will never exhibit any symptoms. So all of a sudden, why one exposed person comes down with this horrible illness, we don't know yet. Right. Um, but because it really is a common bacteria, we should be a little more frightened of it than we are. Well, and I think frightened is a, an interesting word. Okay. We don't want people to be stressed out about this or anxious. We be more aware of it. How about aware? We, exactly. Okay. We feel the horrible uh, pain and emotion that you have and your families have both been through. Yeah. And of course, it's every parent's worst nightmare. Uh, but there is now action to take. Yes. And I always like to fo yes. focus on yes. the good news. The yes. good Daddy, news. Why don't you tell <laughs> about meningitis A? <laughs> so um, menin meningitis B, uh, through our meningitis B action project, we are going to have, we have a B team and we have ad advocates from all 50 states. Mm -hmm. So they recently joined our B team and what they're going to be doing on April 24th, which is also uh, World Meningitis Day, is they're going to be doing individual advocacy actions throughout the country. So it's going to be huge. And um, they might be sharing a social media post. It can be as small as they can tell a friend about meningitis B. They can text someone. They can hang posters. We have great posters on our website, meningitisbactionproject.org. We have great resources. We have pamphlets. We have posters. We have videos. We, we have so much. And you know what? We're really proud of the work that we've done with the Meningitis the Action Project. It's and you should be. You, yeah. You absolutely yeah. should be because everything that you're doing is spreading awareness and saving lives. And it doesn't get much better than that. And I will commit to you, I will retweet everything that you tag me mm -hmm. on at D Dr. Donica. I want everybody else to retweet it. I want everybody else to spread the word. What's our challenge to people? Certainly, if you have children who are over 10, or so, let's say 10 to 23, make sure they talk, you talk to their doctors or they talk to their doctors or both about getting the vaccine. Specifically ask. Or go to CVS, <laughs> to the Minute Clinic or Walgreens or any of your local But stores. specifically say meningitis B. Yes. Because um, sometimes they're not saying meningitis B, they're just saying meningitis. Right. And then the next action step, of course, is to talk to all your friends and family members right. who yes. are yes. in that situation. Um, where can people find out more information about your meningitis B, your B team? How do people sign up to be part of the B team? They can sign up on our website, uh, www.meningitisbactionproject.org slash B team. And we would love for more people to sign up. It would, it would just... I am going to be on the B team. I always wanted to be on the A team, but now I'm going to be on the B team. <laughs> it's, the B team. it's the B team. It's very simple. We're not asking you to do much. It might take five minutes, if that long. And it can really save a life. That is awesome. That's, Alicia, that's any final comments? Protect your children. You know, Patty and I do this work every single day. We talk about our children. We, we rehash the story of, of their death every single day. And we know that nothing we do will ever bring back our daughters. Emily will always be 19. Kimberly will always be 17. But there are millions of other Emily's and Kimberly's that we can help protect. And those parents have the vaccine available to protect them that we didn't have. Please protect your children. There's well, no can't. reason not to. I can't imagine any stronger note to end on. I want to thank you both for sharing your stories, for sharing your passion, for sharing your energy, and for really doing this critically important work to save the lives of so many other people. So thank you. Welcome thank to the Lady Room. Thank please come back anytime and please send me all your stuff, especially I want to see those posters. We will. Thank Take you. care. That's all we have time for today. But let's keep the conversation going on Twitter or Facebook at Dr. Dunica. And please join us next week for another episode of In the Ladies Room with Dr. Dunica. 
Real conversations with real women about really intimate topics.